Welcome to the Dr. Doug Show, where I bring together two critical components of self-mastery, health span and mindset. The topics presented here will help you to improve both your body and your mind and help you to live better, longer. So today I want to talk about cold therapy or cold water immersion. And so I want to bring this up because, man, there are a lot of videos on social media. It's been talked about on some big podcasts like Joe Rogan. Um, and it brings up a lot of questions, which is the most common one I get was, why, why, why would you do this to yourself? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's some, a lot of challenges and questions around what are the real benefits versus what's, uh, sort of been promoted, which is maybe not necessarily true. What could it possibly negatively impact is also important. So it's important to remember that. And I want to give you a little bit about my own experience, which is that personally, I use cold porridge about every day. I have one in my house. I'm very fortunate from that perspective. Um, and I want to talk about the, the benefits that I've seen. So um, stick around. We're going to go through all these things, really dig into the research, and hopefully come up with a conclusion on how you could potentially add this into your life. Okay, so what are the potential benefits of cold water immersion or cold therapy or cold plunge. So here are the benefits that I saw when I did a, a quick search and especially on social media, it's always fun to see what comes up. But the benefits were increased immune function, improved heart rate variability, increased mood, increased energy, increased performance, decrease in muscle soreness and increase in metabolism. Uh, usually people will talk about brown fat uh, when they do that or brown adipose tissue. Uh, discussion of improved sleep, improved resilience to stress, improved pain perception and decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Wow, that's a list. Is it all true though? Let's dig into the research and we're gonna talk about these because actually a lot of these are true, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, I was surprised when I dug into some of the research, the things that we are seeing, but keep in mind, a lot of these studies are small um, and it's this is always true when the intervention that we're studying is free because nobody's going to make money selling cold therapy unless you're selling a product and there are a lot of products that are already on the market so there's not a lot of money to do big studies on this but we can glean a lot out of these smaller studies so i'm going to start ripping through these we've got 10 studies so hang on to your hats um, i'm going to go through them pretty quickly but in the end i want to talk about really the the impact of how long how cold and what we really should expect as well as the risks that you should consider. So definitely make it to the end of this video so you can get to those. Don't just go jump in cold water for 30 minutes. You might find yourself hypothermic. So let's get into this. First thing I wanted to look at was what about recovery? So this is the primary reason why I consider using it is that I like to train hard. I like to lift weights. I want to do as much as I can, but I don't have a lot of time to do it. So I need to recover. So can cold water immersion help me recover? And the answer is, yeah, actually it can. So when we look at other forms of recovery, like active recovery, you know, which would be stretching, cooling down, you know, massage and rolling your muscles around on a foam roller, whatever, a lot of different ways to do active recovery versus cold water immersion. This initial study, this first study that I have from 2022 showed that cold water immersion was superior to active recovery, <clears throat> also superior to contrast water therapy. So hot, cold, hot, cold. I used to do that a lot, but the, this was a, a meta-analysis and the water temperature and exposure were not really associated with the, the outcomes, meaning that they didn't really see a strong trend that the, the temperature really mattered or the exposure really mattered. It was almost more like either they did it or they didn't do it. And that was the impact. Now I bring that up because other studies will show an impact of, of different temperatures. So I don't, don't feel like the, the temperature doesn't matter because it does. But the question is how cold and what kind of impact are you looking to have? So um, our next study is um, a 2022 meta-analysis of 52 studies. Now that is a lot of studies on cold water therapy. Uh, but what they found is that cold water immersion improved recovery of muscular performance 24 hours after an eccentric style exercise or high intensity exercise. They were also doing blood labs and they found that it decreased creatinine kinase, which is a, a breakdown product of, of uh, muscle. Um, it also improved soreness in perceived feelings of recovery. And I don't want to downplay the impact of perceived feelings of recovery, because keep in mind, if you're training and you feel more recovered, if you feel better versus like, like I feel right now, which is, man, I'm sore from yesterday's workout. I didn't do cold water therapy this morning. 
so uh, if you are feeling better, you are going to then train better the next day. So it can have an additive effect over time. So it's, it's not uh, just a mild thing to say that, oh, I feel better. They found in this meta-analysis though, that there was not a significant influence on the recovery of strength, meaning that people that did cold water therapy didn't necessarily uh, lift harder. Although I would argue that if I felt better, I would probably lift harder, but I can't prove that. Now, this study was also great because they sort of broke down the time and temperature variables. So they showed that in these studies that there was an average of 10 minutes of exposure and the water temperature ranged from 46 to 68 degrees. And obviously the warmer it was, the longer it was. And so you're looking at temperatures in the, in the 60s, probably up to 30 minutes, which is a significant investment of time uh, versus going down to like 46 degrees for three minutes. And so um, we'll talk about kind of where I've settled, uh, but that 46 degrees for three minutes is uh, really for me pretty close to what I'm already doing. So then the next question I wanted to answer was, is it all good? Can you just do more? Can you just get colder and longer? And um, are all of the benefits going to be positive? Are all of the impact going to be positive? Better way to say that. Um, and so this next study was a 2021 crossover study. So you get people that are doing one thing uh, versus an active recovery or a control, and then they're crossing over. And so what you can see uh, in this study that used a 10 minute exposure at 57 degrees, so it chilly for 10 minutes. Uh, but what they found is that there was uh, an increase in stress hormones and physiologic stress. So they saw that people were hyperventilating. They saw muscle shivering. I can definitely sympathize with that. They were able to, to see increase in metabolic heat production, increase in heart rate, and they did blood draws and found an increase in epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So is that a good thing? The answer is yes and no. And this is where, you know, not everybody should be doing cold therapy all the time. And so for people that I feel like have high levels of stress or are going through a particularly stressful period, I don't know that actually doing cold therapy and, and, and adding to that stress would actually be a good thing. So I think we need to be careful if we're going to recommend this from a blanket perspective to say, yeah, it's good for everything. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think that we should be cautious in who we are recommending this to um, and use it when times are good, use it when we're, we're really seeing forward progress, but not be afraid to pull back, not be afraid to let yourself have a day or two days. If you're not feeling good, if you're feeling sick, I would actually pull back on that because of these reasons. I don't necessarily want to add more stress to an already stressed environment if I don't have to. There's another study that looked at, again, that same norepinephrine release, and this was to a very cold exposure of 32 to 38 degrees. They looked at this as a positive, though, to say that for people that had chronic inflammation, they saw a reduction in pain, but this was a very short exposure. So this is 32 degree water for 20 seconds. <laughs> so short exposure, but man, it's cold. Uh, and that's sort of the extreme of what we've seen, because obviously if you get colder than that, then um, it's going to be frozen. So if you get as cold as water can get for a very short period of time, you're going to also see some benefit, but we don't have as many studies on that type of exposure because the risk starts to go up. I'll talk about those risks later. So what about mental state? We talked about Im improved perception of, of mood and feelings. So there was a 2014 study. Uh, this was a, a controlled study of a, a cohort of 36 individuals, and they were doing winter swimming. And so it's a little hard to define uh, what that temperature is. Uh, but they saw in winter swimming for four months that they had um, improvements in tension, fatigue, memory, mood, and negative state points. Um, and that was in quotes, by the way, negative state points is what they called it. So after four months, people in the intervention group also perceived themselves to be more energetic, active, and brisk. And that was true compared to controls. If they had a history of rheumatism, which is rheumatic disease, fibromyalgia, or asthma, uh, they reported reductions in symptoms and relieved pain. So one of the things that people talk about with, with cold exposure and cold water immersion is this increase in what's called brown adipose tissue or BAT. Now, BAT is a specific type of adipose tissue that's different from white adipose tissue. And, and white adipose tissue is what we have most of as we age. We have more brown adipose tissue uh, when we're babies. And it's one of the things that helps us to stay warm without shivering. So babies don't have the capacity to shiver like adults do. We don't have as much muscle mass when we're that age. So brown adipose tissue can help to do that. But 
as we age, we start to lose it. In fact, most adults that are not getting exposed to cold temperature have very little brown adipose tissue. So it's not going to play much of a role. If you do cold exposure, it's pretty clear that you can increase the amount or activation at least of the brown adipose tissue. And so that potentially can increase your metabolic rate. It may play a role in sleep and, like I said, increases with cold exposure, but it's not clear if it's just the function or the actual amount of it. I think that's not entirely clear. But as we get into these next studies, you'll see where this can play a role. So uh, this next study I want to talk about is in insulin sensitivity. Now, this is a big deal because when we look at diseases of metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, all the way down to prediabetes, metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance having good insulin sensitivity is really, really important. So this is a small study, eight overweight individuals. Uh, and this was not actually a cold water immersion study. This was actually a cold air exposure. But <clears throat> what you'll see here is that air, because it doesn't conduct temperature as efficiently as, as water, you have to be exposed for much longer. So the exposure here was 57 degrees. And they started out with two hours a day and they were minimally clothed, two hours a day, uh, the first day and then four hours the second day six hours the third day and they did that for the rest of the 10 days um, so you're talking about a six hour exposure of 57 degrees now, i don't have time to sit outside for for six hours um, but what they saw with this is that there was improved insulin sensitivity by 43 percent they were able to measure changes in GLUT4 receptor modulation and they were able to look at the activation of brown adipose tissue so they said that increases in brown adipose tissue, increased energy expenditure, and boosted the metabolism of glucose and triglycerides through these GLUT4 receptors. And ultimately, you see this in insulin sensitivity. So kind of cool. I wish it were done in cold water, and I wish we could see that same impact over a shorter period of time. Because again, six hours at 57 degrees is not something most people are going to do. So what about cardiovascular risk? Well, <clears throat> this is obviously a big one, number one killer uh, of adults in the United States and across the world. So um, if we can improve cardiovascular risk profiles through something as simple and as free as cold water therapy, then that would be cool. This 2015 study looked at cold adapted swimmers versus controls. So these were also swimmers that didn't uh, swim in cold water. And they found that ApoB, which is the um, biomarker we use for cholesterol, but it's looking at cholesterol particles or LDL containing cholesterol particles, and homocysteine were both reduced in the cold adapted swimmers. They also had higher levels of T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. So that's interesting. I would love to see some additional numbers and I would love to see some you know, outcomes of reduced disease and events over time. But again, those studies are uh, more expensive, requires more people, um, a certain at-risk population and a lot of money. So um, I don't think we'll ever see those studies. But it's kind of an interesting perspective to say that maybe ApoB and homocysteine we could improve uh, through cold adaptation. Now, this next study is starting to get into this idea of how cold is cold enough. Um, and so <clears throat> some people will say it doesn't need to be that cold. Cold shower is okay. Other people say, no, it's got to be 32 degrees. And if it's not 32 degrees, you are a wimp. Well, let's look at this. So there's a, a, a 2000 study that only had 10 people in it, but they looked at different exposures and the impact of them physiologically. And so what they found is that water, even at 89 degrees, had an impact. Now, I have an outdoor pool and 89 degrees is not that cold, um, but it is still, you know, if like you're sitting there for long enough, you'll feel a little bit chilly. And so what they found at 89 degrees is that you can reduce blood pressure by 11% and heart rate by 15%. Well, that's kind of cool. So um, 89 degrees, not cold. I would not call that cold water immersion. That's like warm water immersion, but it did have an impact. Um, 68 degrees, that would feel cold. 68 degrees had a similar impact on blood pressure and heart rate, but you started to see this increase in metabolic rate and it was about 93% increase in metabolic rate. So that's kind of cool. And then you go to 57 degrees. In 57 degree cold water immersion, you see that metabolic rate change from 93% up to 350%. This is also where you start to see changes in norepinephrine and dopamine by 530% and 250% respectively. So you see these big jumps um, in these, uh, these hormones as a result of the quote unquote stress uh, of the cold exposure. And um, this is, I think, where you start to see the sweet spot of how cold is cold enough. And again, that was 57 degrees, which is still really not that cold. All right. The next thing I saw to, um, a study on was sleep. And I thought this was cool because again, small study, 12 people. But what they did is they did a, a, a 10 minute exposure, either a quote unquote whole body exposure, which they described as uh, including the head. And I don't know how you stay underwater for 10 minutes at 56 degrees, but uh, maybe they had a snorkel, just the back of their head. I don't know what they did. 
Uh, they didn't describe it very well. But anyway, quote unquote, whole body versus partial, which would be kind of up to your hips um, versus controls that did none. And what they saw is that there was a decrease in arousal, meaning that they had what appeared to be deeper sleep. They moved less uh, for the duration of the night in both the whole and the partial groups. So it didn't actually take whole body exposure. Partial had the same impact, <clears throat> but they also found a lower heart rate variability. And if you're not familiar with heart rate variability, basically it is the um, ability of your body to get into a full parasympathetic excuse me, parasympathetic state. That parasympathetic state requires you to switch off the alternative sympathetic state and really get into that relax recover uh, mode. And so the less recovered you are physiologically, the higher, uh, I'm sorry, the lower your heart rate variability is going to be. And so what they're finding is probably there's impact of the, the changes in hormones that's reducing heart rate variability. Um, but it did recover throughout the night. So is that really a negative? I don't know. Hard to know. <clears throat> so then if we pile together all of the negatives, we look at some real concerns like, what if you actually get hypothermic? What if you actually go too long? Can that change the way that you, um, you know, not only see benefit, but potentially survive this event? Because there are a lot of people that drown in cold water. Cold water swimming results in drowning because you can get cold shock. You can lose your mind. And for people that are, are frail, you can potentially have cardiac arrest and changes in blood pressure that can result in strokes. Uh, cold injury, like thermal injury. I mean, all those things are actually real. So consider when you go into cold water immersion therapy that it is not a competition. And we see this, see it on social media. I'm going to do this for 10 minutes. Oh, I'm going to do it for 20 minutes, you know, and then you can really hurt yourself. So, so uh, don't be stupid about it. Use this uh, in a positive way. One risk that <clears throat> I have heard talked about, and uh, we've found actually several studies on is this what we would consider blunted hypertrophy and blunted strength gains uh, from uh, cold water immersion immediately post exercise. And so this is legit. So this last study I want to point out has 21 people in it now is a randomized control trial. So uh, they were randomized to either cold water immersion or, or uh, active recovery in 10 minutes of cold water immersion. And so what they found is there was a decrease in strength by 19%, hypertrophy by 17%. And what they they described as myonuclei per fiber and biopsy, which means that the, the muscle fibers have less energy producing capacity and recovery capacity by 26%. So <clears throat> that's significant. And even if you would say, well, I'm not really worried about hypertrophy, I don't want to get jacked. Um, I would argue that changes in strength are relevant. So I don't care if you want to get jacked or not, you do want to get strong and you really want to have as much muscle mass as possible. And so that reduction in strength is, is very significant. So um, that's concerning. We saw additional meta-analysis, other uh, randomized control trials that demonstrated the same thing. Uh, it just wasn't uh, calculated as clearly. There did not seem to be a negative impact on endurance training though. Um, and so potentially if you're an endurance athlete and you want to do cold water therapy immediately after training, that's actually probably beneficial mostly because of the recovery. Okay. So then what do we do? Well, I think the benefits are pretty clear. Based off of our research, I would say that there are benefits in improved recovery decreased inflammation, decreases in pain, improves insulin sensitivity, improvement in eh, some cardiovascular risk bi biomarkers, and improvement in mood and sleep. I think all those things are real. The potential impact of negative uh, on hypertrophy and strength, also legitimate, um, and that's something to consider. So for me, where I've settled into this is that the protocol that I like is relatively cold and relatively short, mostly because I don't have a lot of time. I do it in the morning. Um, and I'm very fortunate. Like I said earlier, I have a cold plunge that is always at the same temperature, always ready to go. So for me, I like colder. I like it in water, not in air again, mostly because of the, the time perspective. I put mine at, uh, it's at 47 degrees. Um, and that's a compromise between me and my wife, uh, because she also wants to use it and that's as cold as she's willing to go. And honestly, it's probably as cold as you need to go. So don't need to push that anymore. I do 47 degrees for three minutes and I do it just about every morning, unless I'm traveling or have some compelling reason not to. I think the mental component of that is very powerful. So I know that when I get up, I know it's coming. I know it's going to be cold and I know I always feel better afterward. It helps me to get going for the day. Um, I do also drink coffee as well, but this is this combination of coffee, like hot coffee, cold plunge, and then a cup of, of hot decaf coffee afterwards. It's just a really nice compliment to my morning. 
Um, I think if you want to go warmer, that's probably okay, but you need to go longer. So if your water is in the 50s, probably need to go 10 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes, although you know, 50 degrees versus 59 degrees, probably a pretty significant difference. I think that if you don't have access to a cold plunge, then you could also do an ice bath. It's hard to do that every morning, it takes a lot of ice. Um, but you could also do a cold shower. I mean, it's just so, it's so easy to do. You could also do air exposure. The, the time I'm recording this, this is in December. Um, you know, I could go outside and it's 40 degrees uh, and I could work out there for five hours. But you can get the benefit of doing it. You just have to commit to doing it. And it is uncomfortable. But the truth is, is that's part of the benefit. We as a society have gotten so used to uh, limited uh, discomfort. We really need to remember that it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to sit in discomfort. Sitting in that cold plunge every morning for, for three minutes is a way to start my day by being grateful for the fact that I have a house, I have heat, and I can get out of there and make coffee. And so um, being uncomfortable helps us to respect the fact that we're comfortable more often. So it's okay to be uncomfortable. In fact, it's probably beneficial to be uncomfortable. So that's it. I'll start, stop harping on that. Remember friends that we are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Don't be afraid to be extraordinary because that's what it takes. Now the disclaimer. This presentation is for general informational purposes only, does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this presentation are at the user's own risk. The content in this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. See you next time.